Welcome to Walden Pod. I'm your host, Emerson Green. My guest today is Jack Symes, teacher and researcher of philosophy at the University of Liverpool, UK, and editor of the new re newly released book, Philosophers on Consciousness, Talking About the Mind. So Jack Symes, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Emerson. It's a pleasure to be here. You're also the co-host of the Pan Psychast, and I've been a listener for years now, and I really love the show, so I just wanted to shout out the Pan Psychast before we get started. Thank you very much. That's really kind of you. I listened to a couple of your episodes in anticipation, and you're a very good interviewer, and I'm really excited for our conversation. Thanks. Yeah, it's a lot better than the Pan Psychast, but, you know, yours is okay, too. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, So just to give a brief description for those who aren't familiar with the book, you've got David Chalmers contributing, Daniel Dennett, Philip Goff, Frank Jackson, um, mm. Gregory Miller, uh, Galen Strawson, and others. And, um, you know, it's like a nonpartisan collection of essays and interviews. You know, nonpartisan just meaning you've got, like, more than adequate representation of physicalist and non-physicalist views. And I think it does a wonderful job balancing, like, accessibility and rigor. And, um, you know, like, in every chapter, there's also this, like, extensive list of further recommendations for anyone who's, like, really enjoyed a particular topic and wants to know more. So if someone is looking to get more into the metaphysics of consciousness, this might become, like, my go-to recommendation. Um, it's also, like, it's also really short. It's definitely my length of book. Mm -hmm. um, and... Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really wonderful contribution to the public communication of philosophy and philosophy of mind, no less. So I wanted to congratulate you on that achievement. Thank you. That's really, really kind of you. Obviously, the book is put together with these 12 leading philosophers of mind, and we've got a great team, as well as myself, assistant editor Casey Logue, and those co-hosts, which you are familiar with from listening to the podcast, Andrew Horton, Oliver Marley, Gregory Miller. And Greg writes a brilliant chapter for the book as well. So, yeah, it's, it's very much a, a team effort. And after slaving away at it for, for about a, a year nonstop, it's, it's finally on the bookshelves. And I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's, it's certainly my type of book as well. I'm glad, like, <laughs> in terms of length. Like, yeah. There's no, and to it's... be said about a book that just doesn't, like, it, you don't want to look at it and go, oh, I've got to make yeah. my way through that. Hopefully it doesn't, the size doesn't put people off. Yeah. No, I, um, you know, and it's not the same old, same old, like, reductive physicalism versus dualism, you know, like, you find that in, like, pretty much every other, like, intro resource. And this covers, mm -hmm. you know, like, current areas of interest in the metaphysics of consciousness, and it still touches on, like, those more standard areas, like, reductive physicalism versus dualism. Um, mm -hmm. But they're not really, like, the focus. So, you know, I mean, I think it's got something for everybody. But yeah, I kind of like how it's more current, and it's not just, like, um, you know, yet another text on like, so there's physicalism and there's yeah. dualism and like there are some weird views, but it's like, it's mostly about the, you know, I mean, I say like less mainstream, but it's like, it's more hot topics, you know, in mm. philosophy of mind right now. Yeah, that's a really interesting reflection. That was certainly something we were thinking about when putting the book together. We don't want to just drop loads of terminology onto people and have a big list of things you need to learn about this topic. Let's get straight into the heart of it without assuming that subject knowledge. And obviously, we've got those little boxes as you go when you've got the essential things that you need to know. But on the whole, yeah, it wasn't supposed to be, here's a bunch of stuff you need to learn. It's supposed to be, here's the, here's the interesting part. Here's the exciting part. And that's never learning a big list of data, is it? So I'm glad you think we've avoided doing that. Yeah, no, it was really interesting. Um, at least the parts I've read, I've, I couldn't. I, I think you and I both uh, didn't get the physical copy in time, so I, I, luckily I got the PDF in time to read. I have mine now. I, well, I still don't. I, I'm sorry. I literally got mine like two days ago. Um, I received mine at 6 p.m. of the evening before the book was actually released. <laughs> so now I finally got a copy to read through yet again, but this time make some notes on. So I think I've, I, I'll end up reading this book more than any other in my whole life, but at mm -hmm. least now I've got a copy I can scribble in rather than having annotations and, on a PDF. And you, okay, so you edited this book, but you like, you co-wrote the, uh, the final chapter. And obviously you have mm -hmm. these like reflections before and after um, uh, every chapter, but you, you co-wrote that final chapter, right? Yeah. So my involvement with it really just to, just to break down kind of my uh, fingerprints on it was assistant editor Casey puts together the original transcripts so they can be like 24 30,000 words 
And it's my job to turn that into 4,000 words and rewrite those in a way that's engaging, accessible, and update the ideas as well. Then I'm back and forth for a few months with the contributor, making sure that it says everything they want to do and connects the other chapters. And what we end up with is a completely remastered interview, which hopefully is the platonic form of a conversation. And then we have the original essays in there as well. So I'm helping write those with the contributors and the, helping them fulfill the goals of the, of the wider book and the wider project. Mm. And the final chapter with Mary Al-Bahari, and this has been picked up in a few of the interviews I've done to promote the book, is that some people have said, ah, like, it's interesting that you not only edit this quote unquote anthology, as someone might think it is, but you put your own view in there too. And in that final chapter, you're clearly a, an idealist panpsychist. I, you think there's no physical stuff. It's all just mind stuff. I don't have an, I'm not married to any of the views which are in the book. It was just that me and Miri got along really well and we were enjoying writing the chapter and she said, do you want to co-author this final chapter? Which actually I think works quite well in terms of the book's narrative because now it feels like a bit of a story. It feels like a, a provocative ending to the book. So that fell together quite nicely. But if, as, as I've said, if one of the other contributors said, do you want to co-author this one with me? Then I, I would have as well. It just so happened that me and Miri clicked on such a topic. Yeah, no, it did have that feeling like it culminated in something really, really interesting. Um, yeah, I, I got that feeling as well. And um, actually, you know, I wish I had it pulled up right now, but I think you ended with something like, look, I, I don't really see how we can maintain like full on realism, like unrevised common sense view of the physical and full on realism, you know, unrevised common sense view about the mental. Um, like, it seems like one of them is going to have to go. So which is it? Like which one? And, you know, I, I thought that was fitting, especially since there was so much space afforded to um, what Galen Strawson calls the silliest view that anyone, anyone has ever held <laughs> in the book. Um, but it is like a hot topic, you know, like it's, I mean, I keep saying that phrase, but it's like, you know, illuminativism and illusionism. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like they're maybe a little bit uh, like front loaded. And then you kind of start getting into uh, the more interesting views by my lights. And then it culminates in this like panpsychist idealism at the end. Um, but, uh, yeah, actually, so speaking of <laughs> uh, some problems some people might have with the book, um, there is, there, there's Susan Blackmore, Patricia Churchland, um, Daniel Dennett and Keith Frankish are in the book. Mm. And, um, they're not all, they don't all have identical views, but they're all kind of mm. in the same orbit of like eliminativism and illusionism and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so in the, uh, in the 2020 Phil paper survey, I believe, 4% of philosophers were like in that sort of camp. So you've got one chapter for every percentage point of philosophers who, um, <laughs> who believes it. Um, but it's interesting though, because like in a way I kind of agree with them. Like if you take physicalism really seriously, then you should take those views mm -hmm. really seriously. Um, so I guess I was curious, like are you sort of more in the Galen Strawson side of things? Like where you think like, no, this is ridiculous. Or are you sort of more on the David Chalmers side of things where it's like, though I ultimately disagree, you know, there's like a little, there's a subtlety to these views that maybe Strawson is like overlooking. Like maybe it's not literally the silliest claim that anyone's ever made. Like, I still think it's wrong, you know, but um, so like, where do you fall on that? Like Strawson to Chalmers spectrum? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I guess there's two areas to it, right? The first is, the representation which is in the book itself and the and the, uh, the reasoning behind that and then second of all whether or not I, I fall in with some kind of uh, Strawson or Goss view or Al-Bahari's view one of those panpsychist views the first thing to say is yeah for, for listeners who haven't picked it up already it kicks off with why consciousness matters it goes into the nature of conscious experiences with uh, Chalmers and Blackmore and Montague and Frank Jackson and then we get those deflationary accounts that say the hard problem isn't that hard and that's uh, Massimo Pellucci and Patricia Churchland. Then we get into the illusionists, Keith Frankish and Daniel Dennett that say consciousness is just a physical trick of the brain. And then we move into panpsychism, uh, Galen Strauss and Philip Goff and ultimately end with this uh, weird and wacky view that there is no physical stuff. So it, it, it's very much a, a journey through 
oh, well, like, here's this thing called consciousness. Here's the nature of it. Here's what you probably think of it already. And then it moves that narrative to be provocative, to inspire that conversation, to get people interested in that. Now, there are obviously differences between their views. I think people more generally, the general public, and I think we identified this at several places in the book, tend to favor that physicalist account. They ride the science train all the way to science town. <laughs> and, and, and why wouldn't they? It's... Uh, it produces quite a lot of cool stuff. But yeah, it, I suppose the book does a good job of showing the limitations of that view. And no, it might not be reflective of philosophers more generally, but it's certainly reflective of the people who the book is targeted at mainly. Now, I hope there's some stuff in there for philosophers too, like Frank Jackson's change of heart, going into that in some more detail and his recent thoughts on it. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a book for the general public. It's a book for it's an introduction to um, studying consciousness now my view yeah i think if you really really push me on it i would say i was had panpsychist inclinations the podcast is called the panpsychast <laughs> uh, i was taught by philip goff as an undergraduate as a master's student and uh, a, a good friend of, of galen strawson and i find myself being pushed towards his views not out of, like, like when he says that illusionism is the silliest claim ever made. I don't think it's the silliest claim it's ever made, but I really like Galen <laughs> <laughs> and I want him to like me too. So I kind of like, you know, it's, it's like when you're at a, you know, when you're like at a family meal, you're out with friends and one of them says something you don't necessarily agree with, but you're just kind of like, <laughs> yeah, like, cool. I, I'm going to agree with that because, uh, because, because I like getting along with you. But no, on a serious note, I don't think it's the silliest view that's ever been held. I think it's, yeah, I don't think it's the view, and I'm more inclined to go towards a, a type of panpsychism, perhaps even the view that Miri and I discuss in that final chapter. Yeah. Okay, so you you are more on like the the Goff Chalmers view of illusionism rather than like the Strawson view, where it's like, well, okay, you know, this is wrong, but it's not the silliest claim that's ever been made. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, I think that. I mean, despite some stuff on the surface, I guess, like, I think that something that runs through the book is, that, like, the hard problem is a legitimate problem, and, like, mm -hmm. radical solutions are in order, you know, like, even with the people who say it's not a problem in the book, it's like, yeah, but, you know, you're an illusionist, <laughs> like, you know, you're um, an eliminativist, you're taking, like, radical action to try to deal with some of these problems of consciousness and, and matter mm -hmm. and so on, so it's like, um, you know, like, Reductive physicalism, you know, like Chalmers just kind of dismisses that, where he's just yeah. like, well, look, this can't explain consciousness, obviously. So, like, you know, we can move on. We can move on to more radical forms of physicalism, like illusionism, or mm -hmm. we can move on to non physicalism. Um, but yeah, it seems to me that, like, that's something that goes through the book is like, you know, these are serious problems. These are not just like, um, this is not something that, like, oh, we'll just do a little more science and then we'll get rid of it. Like, yeah. maybe that is the view of, like, one or two people in the book, but it seems to me that, like, pretty much everyone in the book is, like, taking a pretty radical stance to try to deal with the hard problem. Yeah, I think the overwhelming majority of them are, for sure. And I, you know, I favor <clears throat> this, this view myself personally. I do think that if uh, we're, sat we're going to settle up that boring type of physicalism that just says if it just tracks the neural correlates of consciousness and just do more neuroscience do more neuroscience i don't think that's gonna help us solve the hard problem um, I, i'm trying to i was just trying to find a passage in the book from um, massimo pilucci who who does think the opposite of that though so that view mm -hmm. is uh, reflected in there like it quote he says the real hard problem of consciousness will come from a combination of evolutionary biology and neuroscience and Pat Churchland in the following chapter, she doesn't say that conceptual philosophy doesn't have its place and that philosophy doesn't have its place, but she thinks the best shot we've got at it is doing more neuroscience. Let's do the science um, and see what we are uh, and see what we come out with. Um, so, yeah, I personally I think the conceptual problem is a big one, and that there's a that that there is a distinction between the hard problem and the easy problems. And Chalmers talks, I think, in his chapter, he says, I could have called them something else, like the subjective problem and the objective problem. And Goff says there's a difference between the qualitative and the quantitative, and, that, and that's clearly a, a, a big conceptual difference. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I um, yeah, I, I like you know Thomas Nagel's essay, subjective and objective. I think he like yeah. you know pretty convincingly shows that like, hey, these things are not really like reducible to each other, and you know the hard problem and yeah, Goff's um sort of Galileo angle, um, and then so recently there's this um, theistic philosopher Joshua Rasmussen who talks about the construction problem, which puts mm. things I think really explicitly. It's like no, this is just the wrong kind of stuff to be making consciousness out of. Like, right. um, And he tries to defend that intuition, which has been defended by lots of people, but it, I just like that way of putting it, I guess, like the mm -hmm. construction problem. Like, no, you're. it's like trying to put together abstract objects in a way where you get concrete objects. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, it's just like, no, it's, it's not a matter of just doing more science and like figuring out, oh, how exactly do we have to put these abstract objects together in just the right way that concrete objects come out? It's like, no, that's just the wrong kind of thing. You're starting with the wrong kind of stuff. Like, yeah. and you know, he just explicitly tries to defend that intuition. Um, and it's a perfectly legitimate move to say, let's just start with concrete stuff. Like, you know, yeah. why don't we just start there? Like, why are we trying to, um, you know, get concrete objects out of abstract objects. And that's um, Strassen's whole point about the hard problem, I think, is he's mm -hmm. like, we've created this problem out of thin air. Like, you know, we make this completely unjustified assumption about physical matter being totally non-conscious. And then we're just like, oh, how does consciousness come out of this? And it's <laughs> like, well, maybe it doesn't. Why don't we just start with consciousness? And then you don't have to worry about that. Like, let's just start with a different assumption. Um, yeah. which in a way, like you could argue is more justified than the other assumption, but, um, clearly they yield different results and you might want to choose the panpsychist option just purely on the basis that making different assumptions yields better results and doesn't give you this like insoluble mm. conceptual problem, this insoluble like construction problem. Well, given the nature of the book, what's quite difficult is once Frankish and Pilucci and some others have identified the combination problem before the chapters on panpsychism. How do these lots of little experiences come together to form one big unified mind? The panpsychists in the book do have a slight opportunity to underplay how big of a problem that is. So although, yes, I, I agree with you entirely that I agree with you to a large extent that Strawson he does identify the assumption of the uh, the physicalists, or as we would call them, physicalists. And you know, if if evolution needs some kind of basic properties to play with, then it needs some kind of basic uh, like consciousness to to play with, some rudimentary consciousness to form what we might think of as complex, interesting consciousness in more sophisticated non-human animals and humans. But to, back to the your point about the conceptual difference, still. It, and I like how you you think that Goff's view also about bringing in Galileo is quite helpful here. One of my favorite passages from the book is something we added entirely new from the what was in the original interview. I'll just I'll just give it here because uh, I did laugh when I I read it through again this morning, and I remember uh, Goff's comments on there like laughing or something similar as well. So it's a good example of when it was good fun putting it together. He says. Sometimes when I'm lying in bed at night, I imagine what it would be like if Galileo were to time travel to the present day. If a neuroscientist were to ask him, do you think, he'll, do you think we'll be able to explain consciousness in terms of physical science alone? He'd take one look at them, hit them on the head with his telescope and say, of course not. I designed physical science to deal with the quantitative, not the qualitative. <laughs> No, I, I laughed at that part too. I, I came across that. Yeah, I laughed at the Galileo um, assaulting people with his telescope. <laughs> so, I mean, so I wanted to, I mean, we've been like kind of orbiting around it, but I wanted to ask a more direct question about mm. um, philosophy of mind and neuroscience, because, you know, you alluded to this earlier where some people, you know, ride the science train all the way to science town. And they're just like, well, you know, science, you know, ever heard of it? Like there's this thing called science and it can solve yeah. every problem that's uh, ever, you know, anyone's ever thought of. And so I guess the question, you know, if you're going to make a book like this is why philosophy of mind? Like, why not just neuroscience? Because, you know, science is the way that we answer every question, um, according to like, seeming, I mean, like, it's not explicit in our culture, but there does seem to be this like undercurrent of scientism that you know and it's it's hard to because very few people will consciously identify as scientists i guess but they um 
but people tend to think like, well, if you want to know how something works, then mm -hmm. you turn to science. Like that's, you know, and like science can give you the complete story. Um, so if you want to understand consciousness, then do neuroscience. Like that's all you need to understand everything about consciousness. So, you know, why philosophy of mind? Why not just neuroscience? So the first thing to say is that no one in the book favors scientism, the view that mm -hmm. only science can give the answer to the question, if not all questions. And yeah, so the question, why philosophy of mind and why not neuroscience? I suppose we've already touched on a lot of those reasons already. So perhaps we don't need to repeat them in terms of the conceptual difference between objective problems and subjective problems. But I think in the Goff chapter, this is spoken about you know, the question of if a tree falls in a forest, does it make a sound? And I can imagine having a conversation with someone who favors the view that science can explain all this stuff by saying, yeah, like it makes sound waves. Have you not been to a, a physics lecture uh, or did you not pay attention in class? Yeah, it makes sound waves, but we know there's something missing from that picture. We know there's something missing and that that is the conscious experience of sound. And when we moved away from that Aristotelian view of sounds existing in, out there in the world and colors existing, like the redness on, on the tomato was like a property of the tomato and got rid of all those properties and focused purely on the objective ones, we cast out consciousness as an object to be studied by the physical sciences. So it's just simply not within their their scope. Now, there are people that are skeptical of that, but I don't think there's, there's apart from Massimo Pellucci and a, a part of Churchland, but I think her view is a bit more nuanced than people give her credit for, and she develops that bit of nuance in the her actual chapter of the book. I think that they'd all agree that you, you need a strong amount of, of philosophy. Also, more pragmatically, Emerson, is that you've got no chance of me doing a book on neuroscience. <laughs> God forbid. I think uh, Pat Church says something in a chapter just like, yeah, if like the philosophers just want to do philosophy and don't want to get on with the science, then sure, like whatever floats your boat. Uh, it's a lot easier than doing like proper science. And I was thinking, yeah, it is. And that's what I was <laughs> Well, no, it certainly takes a different um, sphere of interests. And yeah. uh, doing pure, punching the numbers isn't isn't one of mine. So I, I think there's more qualified people to do a book on that. And uh, I wish them the best of luck with it. Right. Um, <laughs> no, I, I initially wanted to go into neuroscience when I was a little younger. And then I started to look into like the classes and everything. And I found out that neuroscientists actually spend very little time um, trying to unravel the mystery of consciousness. <laughs> and I was yeah. devastated. I was like, what are they doing if they're not doing that? <laughs> and it's like, they're doing everything else but that. Um, it's actually, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it doesn't, it's not really a, you know, and this is where Dennett's point, you know, seems to hit for me a little bit where it's like, what even would that look like? You know, like a yeah. science of subjective experience, like what questions would you even ask? And it's like, you know, and, and he seems to think that's a big strike against, you know, phenomenal consciousness, like the fact that it's hard mm -hmm. to even form scientific questions about it. And it's like, you know, but it just seems like I agree with Goff. But it's like, this is just a part of our data set. You don't just get to get rid of it because it doesn't yeah. fit yeah. into the data of observation and experiment. Um, but yeah, I mean, one of the reasons, and Goff is really good about this too, um, that you have to do philosophy of mind and not just neuroscience if you want to uh explain consciousness is because subjective experience is not a part of the you know set of publicly observable data like subjective mm -hmm. experience is not publicly observable the way we know about subjective experience is different from how we know about stars and mitochondria and brain activity um you know like uh yeah we have this immediate acquaintance with subjective experience and yeah, I mean, I agree with Goff that that's just a source of, I mean, I say I agree with Goff. I agree with almost everyone who, you know, thinks about this where it's like, yeah, that's a source of data. Like that's something that needs to be explained. Um, and it's not something that we know about through science. And it's not even obvious how science could form questions about it. It's not obvious how science could explain it because, um, yeah, science is this objective pursuit. It deals with publicly observable data. And subjective experience is not publicly observable but not for the same reasons that like you know the dinosaurs aren't publicly observable like it's just it's obviously different to me um yeah i mean it just seems like uh 
it's just crazy to me that some people try to deny this where it's like, look, you have this private subjective experience. It's not publicly mm -hmm. accessible. And some philosophers, I mean, it's a minority, but some philosophers try to deny that. It's like, how can you deny that? Like, it's just part of the data. Like, as soon as you start thinking about thought experiments with like solipsism or, uh, um, you know, obviously zombies, but that can get a little technical, but it's like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, clearly there's this, thing, like, I have access to my experiences. You don't have access to them. And yet they're real. Like, it, it, like again, it just seems like that's just part of the set of data that we need to explain. You don't get to just get rid of it. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's why you need more than science, because it's this thing that we're trying to explain is not publicly observable. Yeah. So, okay, there's, there's lots of interesting things in there, but I, I suppose there's three things that I'd like to to pick up on the first is that okay it's not like why not just neuroscience why not just do science why do philosophy it's not just above my pay grade science but it's also way more fun doing the philosophy right I'm, it's saturday evening here in in liverpool in the uk and you know I, there's nothing i'd rather be doing than uh in, enjoying a conversation about uh, philosophy of mind but i certainly can think of anything worse than sitting here punching some data uh, to, to solve some of the, the easy problems of consciousness. I suppose the second thing is that the science of consciousness you mentioned a second ago, you say, oh, what would that, what would that even look like? And I suppose it's going to look pretty weird, isn't it, if we do a science of consciousness in terms of thinking about like, like someone who really enjoys their wine, they can give us these rich, thorough descriptions of their subjective experiences, which can't be captured in the form of equations, but we certainly could deal with them more systematically. So it, it might look like unusual and not like our current conceptions of science, but it's certainly something we, we can and, and should be developing. The third point is you seem to <laughs> you seem heavily inclined towards panpsychism medicine, and you might just be doing it for the, for the sake of the discussion, but you also seem quite anti-illusionist if you don't mind me describing you as such now i think that the illusionists would be rather upset by the way that you're describing uh, their account of consciousness right the the denial it's very it is very strawson of you but frankish gives the example in the book of you walking uh, down a high street and you come across an old lady with a beetle and she comes up to you with this uh, beetle and oh sorry this it comes up to you with this box and you give her some money and you peep inside the box and you see a beetle. And then uh, she shuts the box, she says something else, and she opens the box again, the beetle's no longer there. He says you've got three explanations. Either you try and look for a scientific explanation and you say, well, here's how that beetle appeared in the box. Uh, or you accept that there's some kind of magic that's actually happened. Or third, you say that it's an illusion. Now, first, with the we might not want to accept the the magic point, right? I think would anyone would be duped, or do you think they were quite foolish or gullible if they actually thought there was a beetle inside the box? And he says you know, this is akin to dualism, or something like along these lines, or a kind of panpsychism, this mystical magical property. He has reasons for not thinking that they're true, but the the scientific explanation he follows a kind of stream of thought that we've been talking about already uh, he quotes goff in his chapter he says how can the equation ever explain to someone what it's like to taste paprika and then he says well we think it was an illusion that the beetle was in the box and then he says he answers the question in the first in his first section outside of his introduction under the subtitle does illusionism deny consciousness he says illusionists don't deny the existence of consciousness in the everyday sense. We don't deny that creatures have conscious experiences of seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, and smelling. We really do taste Marmite. What illusionists deny is that experiences involve awareness of non-physical, private, mental qualities presented like a show to some kind of inner observer. In other words, we deny that the Marmite taste is a private inner quality. So, I think if Frankish or Dennett was here, they'd say, yeah, we don't deny consciousness. We just say it's not what you think it is. I mean, so, yeah, I am. I, I do follow Strawson in a lot of things. Um, but the thing is, like, I, I think I didn't misrepresent their view because I was trying to specify 
private subjective experience. Like, you know, that is what they explicitly deny. They deny that there's any private, um, yeah, private subjective experience. He just said it in that quote. And that's what I'm saying is so crazy right. to me where it's like, no, obviously, like I have access to my experiences in a way that you don't. Like, mm -hmm. that, again, that just seems like a data point to me. Like, um, it seems like we should try to explain that fact about the world. Like, and sometimes I'll try to make this more intuitive for people by being like, you know, any like first year philosophy student is going to talk about solipsism. Well, how is solipsism even conceivable if there's nothing private about, if everything about experience is fully public and like fully mm. publicly observable, then something like solipsism should just sound like gibberish, you know, but mm. clearly there is some, something private about experience. Like, I am definitely conscious. I definitely have this subjective experience, but I don't actually know to the same degree of certainty that you have it. Why is that? <laughs> like, and I feel like any account you give of why that is, is going to sound like this sort of standard, oh, I have an immediate acquaintance with my experiences, but I don't have an immediate acquaintance with your experiences. And illusionists explicitly deny that. They explicitly deny that there's anything private about subjectivity. They think it's all public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it comes down to that starting point, ultimately, yeah. as to whether you are, let's say, a realist about consciousness or your starting point is consciousness. Mm -hmm. like the Cartesian project of, I can be, I can doubt everything in the physical world. What the most, the one unshakable belief that I have is that I exist. I think, therefore, I am. Whereas Frankish and Dennett most probably start from the, the opposite side right we they say we are therefore we think and so it depends what you take to be ontologically superior like what what is the best foundation so it's interesting that this discussion does go back to one of the first things that like students of philosophy read they kind of read descartes and go oh there's no god <laughs> <laughs> like what else does he say and it's like why does he keep talking about this wax like, i just don't understand what the point of that is and you, and you say, oh, okay, Descartes are rubbish, but really, it, I personally, I find the Cartesian project uh, the more alluring of the two. That maybe that's just the the background of, of you know of my philosophical training. It most likely is, but you know, I I can't doubt the fact that I'm, I'm conscious, and it feels like I should build up from that point outwards. Um, yeah. And no, and yeah, I mean, that's not what the, the illusionists do. Yeah, I mean, I remember Keith Frankish and Philip Goff having a conversation on Richard Brown's um, YouTube channel called Consciousness mm. Live about like this exact issue about like epistemic starting points. And it didn't really go anywhere, but it's like, you know, it seems like, yeah, this does get down to the epistemic foundations really, really quickly because we're talking about something that most people just take for granted, like, mm -hmm. um, you know, since data or something like people will cite that as like a properly basic belief sometimes and it's like you know if you're going to doubt that it's hard because it's not really like a normal position you know it's sort of like doubting like basic mathematical truths like you have to quickly mm -hmm. get into like really foundational issues and how you know anything if you're going to even engage with something like illusionism mm -hmm. um but yeah like um i agree with chalmers he says like I think that illusionism is wrong for the basic reason that it contradicts a datum. Like, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. And I don't just mean consciousness exists. I mean, private subjective experience exists, which is something that, you know, they can't say I'm misrepresenting them there. Like, no, you deny that there is private subjective experience. Like, that's what I'm saying is a part of my data set <laughs> that like needs to be explained. So like for Frankish, when he says, say I do a magic trick for you. So, mm. you know, either you can, upend our entire understanding of nature to try to explain how I did that magic trick yeah. or you can say it's just an illusion it's mm -hmm. like you can you can respond by pointing to other things in nature that uh, we don't think are illusions like trees or something like people take trees to be a part of the data of observation that need to be explained and it's like um, if I say you know explain a tree like why does a tree exist with its properties and you say actually there is no tree you know, that's just going to annoy most people. And like, you know, rightly so. Like, mm. I don't know. I, I kind of like, I respect illusionism in the sense that it's a radical solution to the problems, which is necessary, I think. 
Um, but it's like we're walking down this path of like physicalism, which, you know, most people who are, you know, most people are intuitive dualists and you learn a little science and philosophy and you're just like, oh man, physicalism. <laughs> and then you're a physicalist. And then um, if you continue to pursue it, which most people don't, but if you continue to pursue it, I think what happens is eventually you realize if physicalism is true, there shouldn't be consciousness. <laughs> like mm -hmm. there shouldn't be subjective experience. So at that point, you say, okay, well, either physicalism is false or there is no consciousness. And for me, that was kind of a no-brainer. Um, I was like, well, I guess physicalism is false. And some people <laughs> somehow took the other path. And I'm just like, what are you doing? Where are you going? Come back. <laughs> so do you think, like Strawson does, that the denial of consciousness is the silliest claim that's ever been made? Would you go that far? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think that he's right about that. And um, I have friends who are illusionists or who are like curious <laughs> about illusionism. You make it sound like I have friends who have these like deeply like, horrible. I was going to use an example, but I wouldn't want to like be quoted as saying like I have, I have friends yeah. Nazis or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah so some of my best friends are illusionists. Like that, yeah. That's uh, that's that's very good of you, Emerson. That's a that's a very noble <laughs> thing. Because otherwise, they'd have none, would they? Let's be honest. These these boring, dry physicalists with what would they uh, what they do. So you so you think it's the silliest claims ever been made, and you favour a kind of panpsychism. But there's obviously that distinction that we've already made in our conversation between materialist panpsychism and idealist panpsychism. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, a preference towards either of them? Um, I mean, you'd, so I, I know what you mean by those terms because I just read those chapters, but the th conclusion I've come to about terms in philosophy of mind is that there's literally no consistent usage of like terms in philosophy of mind. Like if you took like the most cited, I don't know, 100 or 200 papers in philosophy of mind and like metaphysics mm -hmm. of consciousness, and you tried to create a taxonomy of how these terms are used, like physicalism and idealism and dualism and stuff, I think that it would be totally incoherent. Like, I don't think that people actually use these terms in a super consistent way. Like, they're kind of like the resemblances, like little clusterings, but mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to plant that flag really quick. And like, just to give one example, it's like, um, you know, Galen Strawson calls himself a physicalist. And I think he uses the terms in like a totally principled um historically coherent way like if you hear him out it's like oh yeah this panpsychism is a form of physicalism or at least it can be um mm. and this is not a historical it's not unprincipled like he's using the terms in a really principled way and in a way that's consistent with history um so okay so panpsychism can be a form of physicalism um and then you look at someone like donald hoffman who's an idealist um and you ask him about panpsychism, he'll say, oh, I'm not a panpsychist. But then um, he'll describe a certain type of panpsychism. You say, okay, but what about this sort of, you know, the more Strawson view, like kind of like Rosalian panpsychism or something. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, yeah, I, I agree a lot with Strawson. I find a lot to agree with, you know, like there's a ton of overlap. So how is it possible that like an idealist and a physicalist can be pretty much on the same page? You know, it just see and like they're neither of them are using terms wrong. So I like I just think that you just have to ask people what they mean, like in every specific context. Like, what do you mean by like panpsychist idealism and panpsychist materialism? Like, I, I know what you mean. Like I said, because I just read the text. Um, but um, I'm saying in other contexts, like maybe you disagree with me. Like that people don't really use these terms in a way that can be yeah. made coherent. Like in a in a taxonomy that makes any sense um, like do you disagree with that to an extent i guess i think it's, it's not something i've reflected on much i think it's a really interesting reflection though i think when i was putting together the book for example and adding these info boxes or making sure the ideas were explained clearly there was lots of points of contention and lots of times when I would insert an info box into one of the chapters and the contributor would be like, no, this isn't what that means. And I'm thinking, bruh, <laughs> like in like five chapters time, someone else who shares that position thinks that's how you define it because they wrote it. I'm exactly, just like, yeah. 
how am I supposed to how am I supposed to uh, bring these together? Eventually, though, you, you know, you manage to to tailor the nuances individually to each chapter. So yes, there is some difference in how people use them. But a term like zombie or like uh, right qualia or, or even like consciousness, as long as you've got like a, a qualifier in, in front of it, and, and sometimes yeah these labels are handy these are these are right. quick ways of getting of saying something which otherwise would take a fair few sentences but yeah no i, I just meant like the, the like the labels like physicalism idealism like oh, yeah all the more specific terms are, are well defined i would say but just like the general metaphysical labels are like they seem kind of vague yeah i suppose the straws and examples a tricky one and it confuses lots of people and it's not that one's perhaps not very helpful, but Strawson uses it obviously to make an, an important and interesting philosophical point. The other views, you know, if I if I said I was a, a dualist, it means I believe in two kinds of properties or substances and, and normally which one mind, one brain or something like that. So yeah, I think on the on for the most part, my naive desk reflection is that you know, they they tend to be used fairly consistently, but I'll be interested I, if if you have any, uh, if you think that's really naive of me, I'd be interested to, to hear why, but I'd also love to, you know, see some kind of taxonomy of all these uses of definitions across all these papers. If you've got a, a year free Emerson, then I encourage <laughs> you to, to put it together. No, I mean, it's literally just a, a thought I had, um, like just a few days ago, honestly, it's not something of, it's just, it, it came from just trying to explain to people like, you know, who are asking earnest questions about like, you know, how is it the case that panpsychism is a form of physicalism? Like, is that not an abusive terms? And I'm like, no, no, it's not and like, you know, explaining why and everything. Um, and then just, you know, talking to idealists on the other hand, who like, we, I can find some common cause with, and yet we still disagree on some things. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, the way I see it, it's like, okay, you've got like general camps of like consciousness firsters where they think that like, in some sense, it's like, you know, so panpsychists and idealists, they think that consciousness like is fundamental. They think that um, even though panpsychists are like realists about the physical and the mental, um, you know, they in some sense, you could say, yeah, they think that consciousness is all that exists, really. Um, yeah. And then there are people who are, uh, you know, dualists. So they think at some point there like wasn't consciousness and then there was, um, yeah. and these are like distinct things. And same thing with most physicalists where they think there wasn't consciousness and then there was, but they don't uh, think that this requires like different properties or different substances. Um, and then there are just like uh, agnostics, I guess, like who, um, people who, you know, they're mysterians or they just otherwise mm. kind of give up or think there's no fact of the matter. Um, and I actually, I heard your conversation with Aaron Rabinowitz of Embrace the Void. Yeah. Um, and he wanted to know why there wasn't a chapter on. He uh, loves mysterianism. <laughs> he loves mysterianism. But, you know, it's funny because you said something that sounded, there were, like Aaron and I had like a string of conversations a couple of years ago when I was first getting interested. Um, maybe, yeah, I guess like two years ago when I was like first getting interested in like philosophy of mind and stuff. And, mm. um, yeah, and I I used almost the same phrase you did, where it's like, Mysterianism, it just feels too much like just giving up. <laughs> like, it, it feels like you're just giving up. And I want, like, a coherent, intelligible explanation of consciousness. I don't want to just give up. <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I think that's... I think that's a fair thing to say. I, I suppose Aaron distinguished between two types of mysterianism. One, which is like a soft version that says, we might find out one day, it's pretty unlikely, but we may as well get on with the project. And a hard kind of, we can never know, conceptually, we'll never be able to solve this problem. No, yeah. I don't. I, this the, that's the kind of crap that my undergraduates come out with about like God and stuff, right? They're, they'll sit there for an hour like debating like the concept of God and whether the concept of omnipotence is a coherent one and then at the end they'll just go well we can never know it's like you could say that for every seminar you go to don't say that like no I, I i do feel like it it feels a little bit like giving up it might end up being true sure but i i, I think that we should uh we should definitely go for uh start exploring the other theories um and i i guess even a hard machine wouldn't do that would they so perhaps some 
straw manning them a bit a hard material do they really just go like we can never know i'm going to work on some different projects more likely they'll actually defend the idea that no we can never know and here are the reasons why but to go back to the conversation we're having a moment ago on definitions and those of panpsychism just to be clear like if we could we could distinguish between the the micro psychists and the cosmo psychists it's like ones that think you know, the world is a big conscious mind and that divides into into little ones says the cosmo psychist or the micro psychists that will say that so a quote from the book micro Micropsychists take the smallest microphysical parts of our cosmos to be infused with their own little sparks of consciousness. And so the idealist panpsychist doesn't say, let's just take the micropsychist there as an example. Micropsychist would say, each little atom, electron, proton, neutron has its own little spark of consciousness. And when they come together brain wise, they form a unified conscious mind. Whereas the idealist would just they would deny that there is that microphysical aspect and they would say that it is all purely mental. I think that carves out like a, a quite a useful distinction between the views. Um, and, and there's certainly many views within uh, the realm of panpsychism. Uh, I think perhaps the idealist panpsychist, it's certainly uh, for me, having been acquainted with panpsychism for a while, Idealist panpsychism gets me excited again. It's mm -hmm. even more magical. It's even more <laughs> awe-inspiring, and uh, and I think it provides a, an elegant solution to the problem, and it perhaps sidesteps the traditional combination problem that Strawson and, and Goff would face. Yeah. No, and and just to be clear, I think that um, the way that you just outlined the terms is perfectly clear and coherent. It's just um, I was saying like across different. Um, you know, papers and journals and stuff like I'm not sure every philosopher is using the terms in like a standard way that makes it but like, yeah, no, clearly, that's why I was saying you just have to ask, in this specific context, like, how are people using these terms, you know, mm -hmm. um, but no, I, I am, see, I'm kind of like, I'm open to panpsychism, like, I'm, I try to divide things up like Chalmers does a little bit where it's like, okay, I'm, I have like a pretty decent credence in panpsychism, smaller credence in dualism, and um, no credence for illusionism, unlike Chalmers, but like I've got like some for agnosticism, like the kind of Mysterianism we mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, but w within that like panpsychist camp, it's like I try to remain somewhat neutral, you know, because I mm -hmm. think that like there are so many other areas of philosophy that will determine what kind of panpsychism you favor that it feels almost a little too daunting where it's like you have to have a position on um on like different issues in epistemology and like uh muriology and material composition and stuff and it's like you know i, I want to learn about those things but it's like you might end up with completely different views um just depending on how you sort of independently assess something like material composition like are you like a Muriological nihilist or do you like a restrictive like you think sometimes objects do form um and if so does that require a strong emergence like the kind that like Hedda Hassel Merck would talk about or um do you not need strong emergence to explain how there could be like true objects and it's not just you know aggregations of simples and stuff like that and yeah and you've got to have like some kind of informed opinion on like fundamental reality and physicals and I'm just like look I've I would like to know about all that and I and I do I'm not just like pushing it off indefinitely but I'm just saying yeah. like I kind of just want to be agnostic on different kinds of panpsychism and I'm definitely open to panpsychist idealism um I think some of the critiques of micropsychism are a little bit straw manny because mm. they they rely on a conception of physics that literally no one believes in like you know people buy into no one buys into atomism like no one thinks that like there are these like little grains of sand that are like flying around, like little point particles whizzing around. Mm -hmm. um, but when they start talking about micropsychism, suddenly they do. And it's like, hang on, that's not a view in physics that anyone accepts. Why are you like attributing this to panpsychists? Like we're, we're all like Greek atomists or something like, um, so it just feels a little bit like, you know, some of the critiques of micropsychism where it's like, oh, this leads to a hard, a really hard version of the combination problem. It's like, 
well, yeah, I suppose if I was like an atomist, that would lead to a really hard version of the combination problem. But um, I, I don't think micropsychism commits you to, you know, what I'm calling atomism, where it's like fundamental mm -hmm. reality are these little discrete like billiard balls that are all clacking together. Like, yeah, I agree. That would create a really uniquely hard version of the combination problem. But I don't know anyone who actually holds that view of fundamental reality. So it seems like the critiques of micropsychism um, at least, you know, like, don't you agree? They kind of, they seem to um, imply a kind of like atomist view of fundamental stuff. Yeah, it, I perhaps they do. I, I could have phrased it more carefully and said something along the lines of whatever you take to be is the most rudimentary type of physical stuff out there in the world possesses little bits of, of consciousness. Like you, if you're a micro... Uh, psychist you do need little bits of consciousness somewhere so so where are those little bits so it's, I, I suppose it's again a useful label to to convey the point i don't think you have to be married to atomism or something to be a micro psychist though I, th I think you're completely right there i wonder you mentioned again uh, illusionism and and your, your dis your distaste for it or your uh <laughs> how angry you are that someone like Chalmers would em embrace even 10%, he says in the book, doesn't he? he it's so funny 10%. when I talk to other non physicists because sometimes I like, I overstate, you know, like illusion, like how much I don't like illusionism. Um, well, I don't overstate how much I don't like it, but I'm saying that like I tend to, you know, like other non physicalists seem to be not as put off by it as I am. So sometimes, mm -hmm. like, I, it's funny because this is not the first time I've put a fellow non-physicalist in the position of defending illusionism <laughs> because I like like being too strong about it. But sorry, carry yeah. on. Again, I, I wouldn't even describe myself as a as a non-physicalist. I, I think, as I said, if you push me towards a view, then I would defend a form of uh, non-physicalism for the for the conversation. I think it perhaps gives the most elegant solution. But I, I wouldn't go around calling myself one in this in, in a similar way like i'm really i find arguments for alternative concepts of god or god in itself like really convincing and really compelling but i don't go around calling myself a, a theist and in I just kind of avoid labeling myself entirely these days on those kind of views mm -hmm. but straw uh Chalmers says 10 percent illusionism he says well who's to say i'm not under the grip of some kind of illusion right now the meta problem of consciousness asks why do we say the things we do about conscious experiences so about consciousness more generally including this the statement the hard problem of consciousness is really hard so if we can explain why we say the things we do and why we think the way we do about consciousness then the hard problem will disappear i think that's a an interesting solution and one that's worth pursuing i don't think we should abandon the illusionist research project perhaps they can tell us why we do and say all the things that we do about consciousness and i think that could be a, a strong candidate as a as an answer i just don't think we should shut any of the options down besides again boring old physicalism <laughs> yeah no i mean the way that chalmers puts things in his like meta problem of consciousness it is a little bit more compelling to me it's definitely the best argument for illusionism i actually posted mm -hmm. something on my personal youtube channel of like um of chalmers talking about the meta problem and how it could lead to illusionism and like i've shared it before i was like okay this is the best argument for illusionism mm -hmm. um this is the only and then you know he also makes this appeal which you could make in any area but you know it's just as true here as anywhere where he says like you should always have this kind of like metacognitive doubt of yourself you know like just because you can't see how you could possibly be wrong like well you felt that way before you know and you were wrong <laughs> so so like um you should always have that in the back of your mind like well i don't see how illusionism could possibly be true but you've been wrong about things before <laughs> you yeah. felt certain and couldn't see how you were wrong in the past and now you think you were wrong so um this shouldn't be uh you know any different so i definitely you know agree with that <laughs> yeah some some modesties in in order from the the philosophers aren't they that socrates would be appalled if people were walking around saying this is definitely the answer and this is definitely not the answer yeah a couple of questions later you realize that actually there's a there's a small chance that that it could be true and you should you shouldn't be so so flippant about it not to say you are being flippant about it i i see why 
one would think that it's the silliest claim that's ever been made. And I can see why we'd want to be very anti-illusionist mm -hmm. with, with that said. But I think I imagine Emerson, if I if you, you if I really push you for like a percentage, you you would at least give it one or two percent, wouldn't you? You wouldn't give it bang zero. <laughs> it's like absurd. Like that cannot be true. That's conceptually incoherent or something along those lines. I mean, I guess if I if I'm being uh if I'm properly living with the uh ambiguity of existence and I have to assign a non-zero um credence to it. But I'm saying on like a first order level, I cannot possibly see how it could be correct. Um, okay. But on like a second order level, it's like, okay, but that it shouldn't matter too much. Like you should still assign like, you should, it, your credence should never drop to zero or mm -hmm. one in, in anything. Um, but it seems like, you know, this is always the one thing that, you know, you sh that might be an exception to that. <laughs> but so, it, um, but yeah, no, I, I, I take the point though. It's a good counter example in the book, isn't there? Is that Gorgias says nothing exists? Oh yeah. Or it's in the Gorgias, maybe. Yeah, I, thought, I mean, didn't and then Strauss yeah, was like, "Well, this is the silliest claim that anyone is like seriously made." Or yeah, he said seriously maintained that wasn't high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish we could know um, if that guy was. I mean, I know he was a sophist and everything, but you know, the nothing exists guy. Like, what was he? What was he thinking? Because it almost seems like, um, I don't know. I, I just get this feeling sometimes arguing with illusionists or with, um, I'm trying to think of a comparable view, like, um, I guess like error theory, like moral error theory, like just the idea that nothing is wrong. Yeah. Um, like it's stuff like that, you know, these positions that deny things that seem really fundamental and really obvious to pretty much everyone. Mm -hmm. um, oh, is it, you know, is it really like something or do you just think it's like something or, you know, is anything really wrong? You know, like, mm -hmm. which follows from error theory that like nothing is wrong. Like the Holocaust wasn't wrong. Like it's like, but these are positions that are defended by like intelligent people. There's just something about it that it tests my love for philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh, it doesn't test at all. I, uh, I think a lot of people go around saying things like everything is meaningless in the fullest sense of the term. And yeah, don't, uh, they might not be accredited theorists, but people say that and mean it. And then perhaps when they realize that that sentence itself, they think is meaningful, they quickly abandon the view, but they at least hold it for a moment. So I think there are silly views held by people mm -hmm. which just don't last uh, very long and people reflect on them. But maybe illusionism for someone like Strawson or yourself or someone who's holding that, that uh, realism about consciousness. I can see why they think that given how long they hold the view for and how much work they put into defending the view, how that could uh, be, even, be even sillier. But mm -hmm. I also see, again, to give the illusionists hopefully a, a, a fair defense here, is that if you're not an illusionist and you don't think boring physicalism can work, then you end up having to accept one of these weird non-physical, or maybe the non-physical, but these weird, unobservable, wacky properties. Like, like consciousness is everywhere. Like consciousness <laughs> is the whole universe, or consciousness is in little parts of the universe, then comes together in this weird and wonderful way inside the brains of humans and non-human animals. Or you have to say, the soul kind of jumps in and at this point in time. And obviously that latter view is... Is, is the most popular one. Like, I can see why an illusionist would want to avoid having to put that thing into their ontology. So, again, that I think it's, meaning, it's a... Um, consciousness? <laughs> yeah, like phenomenal, non-physical, private qualities in my Cartesian theatre type thing. Mm -hmm. I can see why you'd want to avoid having non-physical consciousness in your, in your worldview, because it yeah, like that that's a that's a that's not a small thing to incorporate i mean i just think i mean like i saw someone reply to keith frankish the other day or i guess the other week now but um they said something about how ridiculous it seems to them to you know kind of make these fundamental changes when you know all because of one local phenomenon mm. and i'm like one local phenomenon? are you talking about 
the thing that gives all life meaning, like the first and fundamental datum of existence, like the one thing that can't really be doubted, like the thing that is your most essential property. And, you know, I will reiterate the thing that makes it so anything matters in the first place. All right. One local phenomenon. Yeah. Why would you change anything because of that? Like, it just like, I don't understand how they get in this headspace where it's like mm -hmm. the stuff of physical science, like, which is, um, you know, very abstract and stuff like that's somehow more real than the experiences that you're having right now that are like right in front of your face. Like, it's just very odd to me to like attribute, I don't know, like more reality or like more credence to um, just like the abstract elements of physical science than to your own first person subjective experience that you're having right now. Like, it seems like that's the starting point. <laughs> do you not think it will, uh, do, do you think it transforms our understanding of reality in any practical sense so the illusionist wants to avoid putting consciousness absolutely everywhere or have some kind of immaterial souls or some of those other candidates which aren't strictly physical properties alone if you do buy into a type of panpsychism that that you yourself favor emerson do you not end up with some like uh some like moral problems perhaps and mm -hmm. not yeah moving away from the metaphysical yeah, no, I, I definitely, I wanted to ask you about the practical implications as well, but like, I, you know, are there practical implications of illusionism? I mean, I think that there are practical implications to all these different metaphysical views. Um, but it's interesting because Dan Dennett, you know, he was like slamming panpsychism because it doesn't really have any consequences. And uh, he's like, oh, nothing follows from this. And, um, and I, I was just like, well, I don't really agree with that, but what follows from illusionism other than like uh, you can use science to fully understand consciousness? Like, I mean, what even follows from illusionism? I mean, like the only thing that follows from panpsychism or at least what minimally follows from panpsychism is that there is no more hard problem. Um, and that seems to be about as significant as saying you can use neuroscience alone to understand consciousness like these mm. kind of seem like similarly significant slash insignificant things where it's like they're sort of purely theoretical you know like so i mean I, so again th that's sort of like the minimal level like minimally panpsychism means that there's not really a hard problem so you can sleep at night finally and <laughs> you know like illusionism means that you can use science alone to understand consciousness and you can sleep at night in a, in a different way, I guess, for a different type of person. Um, and, uh, but th I think that there are more implications, you know, but like they take some drawing out, but like minimally that's what follows, but it just seems weird to me for Dennett to make that criticism where he's like, what even follows from panpsychism? Um, you know, we're just gonna keep doing neuroscience like we were before. I'm like, well, isn't that also true of your view? And like, um, is, is the one thing that he can say though that the panpsychist has these these non-physical properties like how are you even going to study them like what kind of progress are you going to make once you posit these things maybe Dennett would say that at least if we're illusionists we can keep working on questions about why we say the things that we do or think the things that we do about conscious experiences I mean are panpsychists going to be opposed to that in any way yeah. Like, I don't understand what, like, because, I mean, this is sort of the point about neuroscience being neutral and independent of these metaphysical questions. Like, neuroscience is basically going to go on regardless mm. of whether we're panpsychists or illusionists or even, like, emergent dualists or something like that. Like, it's it does matter, like, these metaphysical questions, but, like, the empirical um, pursuit, you know, the, the neuroscientific questions... I really struggle to see like how that really would change as a result mm. of like the metaphysical questions, whether you want to be like, you know, an illusionist or a panpsychist or whatever, it just doesn't really seem to change the neuroscientific project. Yeah. But isn't there a, a clash between Michelle Montague and Dan Dennett in the book in terms of the kind of uh, type mm -hmm. of uh, study of consciousness that we want to do and, he calls Michel Montague's view auto phenomenology and what he gives the ominous title hetero phenomenology. And the auto phenomenologist can learn or say things and make progress with the, what the nature of consciousness is like. 
um, and, and make and make progress on um, perhaps some kind of problem of consciousness, like easy problem of consciousness, descriptive, like what it's like to have experience type uh, science of consciousness from the first person point of view. Whereas Dennett isn't happy with that. Like he says, like some people think that they can just know stuff about the consciousness simply by sitting there and reflecting on it. Where well, we certainly wouldn't say that about our metabolisms or something else <laughs> like that. Yeah. And yeah, so he, there obviously is a big difference in approach in terms of what someone like Michelle Montague and 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 the like would say is is a legitimate form of forming beliefs about consciousness. And that isn't accepted by the illusionists because they don't believe there is that in a world of qualities to be described. Now, they want to, you can take on board what people think is that subjective data. So they need to say all the things that they think they're experiencing. But that also needs to be tracked and, and tested in terms of objective features about the world. I'm not sure personally how that would play out or what that would, would look like. And I must admit, I'm... I'm slightly confused as to even the example that's used in the book. So the example used in the book is something like, well, we we ask people to look at the shape and turn it into this shape over here. And then we find out whether they're actually doing it. I mean, how the hell do you find out whether they're actually doing it? I, I'm, but that might be my naivety and uh, the fact that phenomenology more generally does fall beyond again my, my pay grade yeah i, I mean i mean I, I don't mean to just continue to come back to how weird illusionism is to me but it's like isn't <laughs> that example you, you just gave like doesn't that just kind of undermine the whole thing like the fact that you can't just actually see if they're doing it is <laughs> like <laughs> you have to ask them because it's private like doesn't that kind of undermine their whole point? Like the title of this interview, Emerson should be Emerson Green slams, <laughs> or, like destroys illusionism. Emerson Green uh, complains about illusionism. Jack Symes tries to convince him it's not that crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jack, Jack has to try and think of the top of his head what an illusionist would say <laughs> if he was uh, was in this situation, and hopefully, uh, if if, some, if if Keith Frankish, Keith, if you if you're listening or, or viewing, I. I, I hope I've I've done your view some justice. I mean, the phenomenology point is good though because I uh, I have this friend um, uh, Tariq Lacour who's an illusionist, um, and I, I mentioned something about phenomenology. How like, oh, you know, phenomenology should be a part of like uh, trying to understand consciousness because we're trying to relate brain activity and the first person subjective experience and like if we want to do a good job of explaining these things like in terms of each other, then we need to have a clearer understanding of the things that we're relating, which includes that phenomenological half of it. Um, and uh, he was just like, there is no phenomenology or something like that. He was like, um, the phenomenology stuff is just so boring to him, you know, as an illusionist. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder how much this reduces to like personality types of like, you know, you just think phenomenology is a waste of time or something, and you're just like, uh, yeah, but I mean, it, it seems like uh, phenomenology, I, I have like the least familiarity with of, of all the things that were discussed in the book. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and probably myself as well. So we haven't done a very good way of navigating our discussion towards things that we can say, particularly <laughs> a nuance or, or have any hot takes on. But again, I think maybe your friend, uh, but he's saying it for for the sake of a little bit of theatre, because really, even the illusionist does care about some kind of phenomenology, and they right. certainly take on board what the auto phenomenologist says about their experiences and, and engages with with things like that. Right. I, I'm sure he would not. I'm sure he would say like, okay, there is phenomenology. It's it's just not what you think it is. It's more like how Dennett describes. Um, but uh, so you, we touched on this just for a moment earlier about like the practical implications of some of these views. Um, so uh, the practical implications, um, I'm not quite sure I buy the, the argument that like, well, if illusionism is true, then like no one has ever suffered. And like, there's no, like, I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's hard for me to make sense of that because of course they don't want to deny that people are experiencing things. They just want to deny that people are experiencing things. Makes sense. 
So, you know, <laughs> there's some... Are you disagreeing with Strawson here, Emerson? I should at least try to carve out an area of disagreement. <laughs> but, yeah, I kind of... I kind of wonder if that's really true that like, um, cause on the one hand it does sort of seem to follow from what they're saying, yeah. but it, it seems like a bridge too far, even for illusionists to be like, yeah, no one has ever suffered or felt pain. It's like, um, you know, even though, even if it was just, oh, they, they thought they were having this qualitative experience of pain. Um, ultimately, like, I think an illusionist is perfectly free to say like, okay, just because you've gotten rid of this like subjective experience, like this private subjective experience, that doesn't mean that these, you know, material, purely material states don't have value. Like some mm -hmm. states can be valuable and other states are not valuable and, you know, like, you know, negatively disvaluable, you know, like um, you can still, you can be a consistent illusionist and say that pain is bad. Um, yeah. Even though you have a completely different idea of what pain is than, than everyone else. Like, you can still say pain is bad and pleasure is good. It's just, you're talking about, you know, pain and, you know, your weird illusionist conception of, of pain, which, you know, has purely to do with like reaction to stimuli and things like that. But, you know, yeah, I, I guess I do disagree with Strauss in there. <laughs> yeah, you do. I, but again, maybe this comes back to a point you made earlier about the equivocation of uh, equivocating terms, like saying that, Strawson says, if the illusionists are right, then no one has really suffered. No one ever has really been murdered or raped or been the victim of, of, of genocide. Like in terms of like, they've never really suffered those things. Mm -hmm. The illusionist does say something very similar to that. The illusionist says no one has really suffered. What they might mean by really is they've had the quote unquote illusion of suffering, which isn't to downgrade it like they think they've had the experience of it and it was extremely real to them and it's a bad thing mm -hmm. yeah but when strawson says that they haven't really suffered he he's saying that they haven't had that that a part of what it is to suffer is to actually have that inner mental quality of suffering which the illusionists deny and he he has changed his mind on a, on a couple of points in this uh, the first one is that in the New York Review of, of Books in which he responds to Dennett a couple of years back, he says that we should be fearful that people will start believing in illusionism and this idea would escape outside the academies. And can you imagine if people started thinking that no one actually suffers and that's a legitimate and, and the best theory of, of consciousness that we have? And he's, he recounts this in the book. He says... You know, I included that somewhat unwillingly. Uh, yeah. And I'm looking forward to when contributors to philosophers on consciousness say something similar when like Keith Frankish is asked, why are you so obsessed with Marmite sandwiches? And I hope he <laughs> says like, I included that somewhat unwillingly, but hopefully there's not any, <laughs> any big points in there. The sec second thing he says is that like uh, P.F. Strauss and his, his father who has that argument about the illusion of free will, we can't help but believing that we're free. Mm -hmm. Similarly, Strawson runs a similar argument about illusionism. We can't quite help but feel like we're, um, that we have this inner world of qualities and that we do genuinely suffer. So it's not like people are going to start thinking that people can't suffer because they're, they're gripped by the illusion. The illusion is a very, very strong one, one we can't escape. Right. I hope you don't mind this conversation being, um, you know, a lot less structured than the ones that you have on the <laughs> pants, I guess. I was like, I hope he's not, like, bored or just like, what, where is this going ever? So am, like, I coming, am I coming across it? I hope I'm not coming across as bored. I'm no, no, I bored. just... I, that, that's a, that's a, one of the limitations of behaviorism right there. The yeah. inner world, uh, my, my pineal gland is, is on right. fire right now. The seat of the soul is... is, is I'm jumping up and down. No, and it, I it's it's interesting going from like podcast to podcast lately and seeing the the different formats and and structures. But I I know after listening to a couple of your others that you know, we're having a, a relaxed conversation and just seeing where the conversation goes. So yeah, so I just I, I, I love talking to philosophers and just like picking their brain and like. But no, I just noticed earlier that you were just like trying to like 
nudge me towards one of the conversation the questions it's I think. you were about to start asking me about phenomenology and i was thinking <laughs> <laughs> i was like i know emerson's got some he's keen to talk about morality and ethics and i hope he doesn't think that i'm thinking yeah let's just talk about phenomenology <laughs> but uh, but we carried on anyway and we're still on the metaphysics oh we're kind of on ethics now aren't we that's uh we're getting there yeah <laughs> we're um, getting there. We're getting there. now we're in this weird meta conversation about the nature of interviews <laughs> but uh, you're the interviewer so i'll let you uh, i'll let you take this conversation where you'd like it to go i'll stop trying to hijack it no no please i just um i just your your screen is a tiny little thing so i can't really read your face very well and then once you were just like so you know what about these like practical implications of panpsychism and i was like oh no is he worried that it's like too unstructured or or too you know because the panpsychast is a very like disciplined um you know, it, it's, it follows like a certain like formula and I, you know, people like that about it. Um, and I use this platform to bring on philosophers who I think are interesting and ask them all the dumb questions that I have. And um, it's not exactly the same thing <laughs> as the pants, okay. I guess, which is like an educational resource. And this is more like, it's more special. I mean, I think my audience is, um, you know, they already have a lot of background knowledge like this is sort of a niche podcast you know and like mm. they're you know they, um, by the way i'm, I'm chopping out this part <laughs> but um no, just no, that's fine you it's uh you, you're welcome to include it i'm quite enjoying the the conversation about the the nature of podcasting and stuff but but do count yeah. no i mean it's just it's more niche it's not really supposed to be like it's not always supposed to be like educational it's like people who are already interested in this yeah. like yeah it's it's more narrow um but like you know people want to know like people are there, there's like a subgroup of like a couple thousand people who are genuinely like reading you know like paper after paper about like yeah you know panpsychism and, and illusionism and stuff and it's like that's just a niche that I, I really enjoy and um i enjoy you know having these uh sorts of conversations and, and getting more in the weeds um but no, it's uh, like the the discussion in the the pub after you've been to the the lecture or something right or when you meet like-minded people who are interested in the field and you can get right into it and there's definitely something to be said about that and we we're definitely going towards uh, different audiences and that you know our, our audience like you say they they like the structure they like to know exactly what's happening and when and there's a rhythm to that and when like we like structure in general right when you go and sit mm -hmm. in the same room as you did last time you tend to sit in the same place you, you you do the same things we form these routines and people like these routines and so we we do follow them but at the same time what you don't want after the lecture on philosophy of mind is to get to the pub and everyone's like, right, first order of business is this. You're like, <laughs> no, like we're off the clock here. So yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm enjoying the, the format. Okay, good, good. Um, so I do, I actually do want to get to those questions though, because it's something that I, I also disagree with Strawson on point number two. Mm. Um, so now we've got two things on the list that I think Strawson is not right about. <laughs> um, very short list, but, um, you know, if panpsychism is true, some people think that it doesn't affect our lives at all. And like some people think that it should affect our lives. If like some people use this as an argument against panpsychism, like I mentioned, um, Aaron Rabinowitz earlier of Embrace the Void. And when we had that like string of conversations, um, he was like, uh, I, I was more interested in just the abstract philosophical arguments for panpsychism. And yeah. he kept bringing up these like, potential moral implications and at he the time his ethics, was, isn't he? yeah he's an ethicist so but i mean at the time i was like you know enough already with this practical <laughs> stuff like i i just want to know like if panpsychism is is true or not like for its own sake but um i don't know i'm sort of starting to move away from not just that view about panpsychism but that view about like everything in philosophy where it's like that whole attitude about like well, who cares what the practical implications are? I just care about if it's like true for its own sake, like this will to truth. And like, I don't know, I'm just increasingly skeptical of whether that's even a thing. Um, or, you know, even if it is, whether we should think like that. But I've kind of done a 180 where it's like, I just in the more general <laughs> sense, but also on panpsychism, like I think it actually does have moral implications and practical implications. And I think they're mostly good. <laughs> But was your first point that you you're not particularly interested in them though though so you i wasn't you, you, and now you are though yeah oh so you you've done a complete 180 and now you're interested in the moral implications and one of the moral implications is you think that panpsychism will be good for for ethics mm -hmm. like so goff obviously 
brings up a few reasons why it could be good. One is that we won't be alienated from the universe in the same way that the physicalist is or that the dualist is. And he thinks that the physicalists ultimately are, are types of dualists in which they think that mm -hmm. when they go about their day-to-day -day lives, they think that they're these conscious minds and they think that the natural world is a mechanism. And I can, actually, I can see why if you thought that the whole universe was alive with consciousness, why one, you might think that the universe is a more valuable place, and two, that you feel more connected to that place and less alienated from it. I'm not sure about the ethical implications in terms of whether or not we treat plant life or the natural world more generally any differently. Because even Goff has to accept that there are some things in the world that we can say have some kind of macro minds and mind that's come together and then count those conscious agents. Like he doesn't think that kicking rocks and, you know, and uh, punching doors is like gonna, is, is morally problematic. But he does think that chopping down trees and ripping up plants would be, or plucking a, that's a mango from a mango tree a little bit too early. Right. Maybe, um, yeah, so so the first two points <clears throat> I think I, I'm on board with, but the, the third one, not so much. If you think that consciousness is a property which we should value, like if you think that it's worse to kill a conscious thing than a non-conscious thing, then yeah, if you had a world which had more consciousness, then it would be a more valuable world. Right. doesn't seem to have any moral implications there. The second one was about being alienated from the world. I'm this type of thing, but the world's that kind of thing. The panpsychist says, no, you're both the same kind of thing. You're at a one with the cosmos. And again, that might make you have a better sense of well-being. Uh, you might feel, I don't know, I'm, typically the, the feeling of alienation isn't one that's struck me particularly hard, but I know for a lot of people, alienation is a, a can be a, a difficult issue for, in terms mm -hmm. of well-being or feeling it again at one with the world or feeling like you've got a place in the world and so yeah i don't think there's any moral problems there the way i'd characterize goss view is i'd say that the moral the purely moral ideas come in when we say there are conscious entities which are non-human animals and humans so the physicalist presumably a reasonable one will say that non-human animals and humans, let's say the illusionists, say that they have the illusion of consciousness or some kind of illusion of consciousness. But the illusionist or the physicalist typically doesn't think that plant life has consciousness, but Goff does think plant life has consciousness. He thinks they're, you mentioned Hedda Hazel Merck earlier, maybe they've got enough integrated information to be considered uh, a conscious creature. You know, Goff cites some work about the the wood wide web and how they can communicate with each other and share resource with each other. And he thinks the thwarting of ends, like when you chop down a tree or you don't water your plant, that, that there's a type of suffering involved there. I, I know I, I don't buy that the, I, I, I accept that it's difficult to identify the cutoff line between when a creature can be said to suffer or not suffer, but does the, is the plant suffer? Like, why would I think Strawson raised this point when I, I shared a version of the chapter with him, and he he said something along the lines of, "Well, why evolutionarily would they develop that capacity to feel pain? Mm -hmm. Trees can't exactly get up and run away. What? How, why would they develop a capacity to to suffer? Like, do they have are they, are they that complex an entity that they could experience any deep sense of of suffering at, at all?" So they do seem like uh, mechanisms, even on the, to me, even on the panpsychist account, rather than a, an individual subjects of experience. So I don't feel like the ethical implications are going to rub as hard against me as they do against uh, Goff, because, yeah, I, I'm quite happy to, to eat the plants and the mangoes mm -hmm. and, and everything. But even, even Goff's view seems, I, I mean, I've got in trouble before. I think Goff emailed me like a few months ago, like saying, I'm going to sue you. That was liable. <laughs> and my impression of him four or five times on the fan sidecast. And he's like, can you correct that in a future episode? So Philip, again, if, you, if you're listening or viewing this, apologies if I've already got your view wrong. But I'm going to go one step further here. 
and only it's because it's late of an evening and I've, I've had uh, had had a can of beer, Philip. So so do apologise. But I think Philip's view is even a little bit. May I, it strikes me as weirdly inconsistent anyway. And I know that he's no, not he's inconsistent philosophically, like metaphysically, but perhaps in the sense of your pragmatic response to plant life being conscious. And I know, like Philip. He does significantly reduce his, his impacts on, on non-human animals and, and the suffering in the world from a personal perspective, and he does take it seriously. So maybe this is an earlier view that he held, which was, well, if you're a panpsychist, it's really hard to know what you can eat if you think plants can suffer as well. I think David Papano raised this point to him in the, in the first time we had Goff on our show, which was, well, you still care about reducing suffering, right? If mm -hmm. everything you eat is going to cause suffering, simply choose the thing that causes the least amount of suffering and I, I, to be honest i did say i was just about to to trash his view but actually i think you'd wholeheartedly accept that, that, that <laughs> characterization and conclusion yeah i mean it, it's definitely open to a panpsychist to follow galen strawson who i heard say offhandedly once um as far as i know nothing changes yeah um and just because and the reason for that is that just because consciousness is everywhere um it doesn't follow that morally significant consciousness is everywhere because no one thinks that all conscious beings are like equally morally significant like mm -hmm. in fact that would be an insane view like if you thought that every like sparrow was equal to every like human child like you know exactly those are if you if you can only save one I, you're just gonna have to flip a coin because there's no way of telling which one is one. Yes. like that's a crazy obviously sparrows but like human child children can't do a lot and they're very dependent and sparrows are independent and they, they can fly and they're, they're pretty cool yeah i mean for sure i don't this is not an anti-sparrow podcast but <laughs> it's um, it's definitely like just because a panpsychist thinks that even like sentience, like if you you can be like a sentientist and think that like moral questions are ultimately about you know, um, uh, you know they they're reducible to questions about sentient creatures, yeah. like that's not incompatible with panpsychism because there's clearly some kind of hierarchy of complexity. Like a panpsychist is going to think that human consciousness is more valuable than bug consciousness, and there's a perfectly like a, a perfect gradation of corresponding physical complexity yeah. to mental complexity so like as physical complexity increases there's going to be a correspond a perfectly corresponding increase in mental complexity uh -huh. um probably more valuable states of affairs like if for no other reason the sort of like inductive reason that strawson pointed out where it's like well look um because panpsychists believe that the physical and mental are like two sides of the same coin we can infer what's going on based on behavior and the mm -hmm. fact that trees don't really have the same capacities to recoil from stimuli in the same way that like you know primates do then we can make an inductive inference about what the inner life of a tree would be like um but i think that you know hedda hassel merck might point out you know because she has this very general view of, of causation of like mm -hmm. the phenomenal powers view about how like because it does kind of follow from panpsychism that if you believe in causation and if you believe in panpsychism, then all causation is mental causation, right? Like, it seems like that pretty much follows. And, like, I think she kind of takes that to, you know, she, like, really lays this out in a consistent way and creates this really compelling, like, metaphysical view of consciousness that's, like, you know, really parsimonious and um, it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and it's sort of like when things are stable you can sort of infer that in some sense they're willing to be stable like it's sort of like a schopenhauer type view like mm -hmm. when things are in stable configurations they're like they sort of want to be that way and if you're frustrating their aims or um upsetting the way that they just naturally are left to their own devices then you can kind of infer that what you're doing is um at least like more significant than just um upsetting a totally non-conscious mechanism yeah no that's uh i think you've put that that really well and i do see um, why someone might be compelled to to think something along those lines the first thing to point out is that i think you're right right and in terms of strawson's view i'd again if i was pushed i'd probably go towards that view that as far as i'm aware nothing changes nothing perhaps is putting a bit too forcefully because what does change is perhaps the sphere of 
um, entities that are included within a, uh, which should be in our moral calculus and moral decision making. And trees and plants, says Goff, should be in there. Mm-hmm. I guess Wilson just denies that outright, though, doesn't he? So, yeah, I suppose he's quite happy to say nothing changes. For me, something does change and that there's more things that potentially go into there. But then mm-hmm. that's only if you think that a capacity for pain, pleasure, happiness, suffering is what's morally valuable and not just being a conscious creature. So for David Chalmers, he thinks that it's just being a conscious creature that makes you morally valuable. So he gives the example of the Vulcan trolley problem. Well, first of all, we'll do the regular trolley problem where you've got one human creature, a conchi, and then you've got five philosophical zombies. And which one do you do you kill and you save? Well, you kill the five non-conscious creatures, these imitation men. But then you put next to the, let's, let's say we've got one normal conscious human being, and then we've got five Vulcans, these replicas of human beings that are exactly the same, except they can't experience pain, pleasure, happiness, suffering. All of their mental states are completely neutral. And he says it would be monstrous to kill the mm-hmm. human being. Oh, sorry. Apologies. He said it would be monstrous to kill the Vulcans instead of the human being. Right. I'm still not decided on on actually like if you really push me hard on what i would do in that situation however if you think that vulcans are morally valuable then it doesn't matter whether plants can feel pain pleasure experience happiness suffering all that matters is their conscious entities and therefore they should have moral value in and of themselves i mean i I agree with chalmers though that like you know anything that's conscious is intrinsically valuable but I just don't think that that commits you to something like all conscious beings are equally morally valuable. Like, no, they're all morally valuable, but you can't possibly think they're all equally morally valuable. Like, I don't think, does he actually say that, that they're all equally morally valuable? Who's that? Does Goff say that? No, Chalmers. Choff doesn't, Chalmers, I'm not, he, he, I'm not sure. He doesn't commit himself in, in the chapter in our book on it. And I haven't read anything to think that he does think they're equally as morally valuable. Yeah, I think if you put one human being next to one Vulcan, I think the obvious choice would be to kill the one Vulcan. Yeah. But in terms of consciousness clearly being valuable, you said there that plant life, it doesn't matter that pain, pleasure, happiness, suffering, all that matters is it's conscious, and therefore we think it's intrinsically valuable. Mm-hmm. I suppose I'd want to get clear on what we mean by it being intrinsically valuable. Do we mean that it's morally valuable? Uh, like I, th- I think that great works of art and paintings and music are intrinsically valuable, valuable within their own right, but I don't think they're morally valuable. I don't think there's anything morally, uh, like I don't think they're moral subjects in the same way as non-human animals, like even if non-human animals couldn't experience these, these mental states. So mm. perhaps we're, again, confusing what we might think of as a great making property something which is good with something that is something we should put into our moral calculus. Because I can pick out loads of things that are good in the world, lots of things that I think are intrinsically valuable, but a lot of them wouldn't be candidates for being moral subjects. I mean, I I guess the reason my position might seem kind of blurry there is because I think that panpsychism has implications in both realms there. Like, I think it does have, like, moral implications and it does increase the, like, valuableness of the world. But... I mean, I would push back, though, on, like, you know, a work of art being intrinsically valuable. Like, is it really yeah. valuable just in, it's not valuable because it's valuable to humans. It's just on its own, just, like, valuable in and of itself. Yeah, is it valuable for some for some of the person? Maybe that's a, a bad example. We typically think of, of well, there's got to be lots of candidates for things that are good within themselves, right? Like, it's not, no, sorry, it's not good for some other ends, right? The art is, mm-hmm. is is an end in itself right um, and i just want to distinguish that from oh, right. something which is valuable as a moral subject in and of itself i mean uh the thing so a direct moral implication of panpsychism i think is that there's no way you could be some kind of like neo-cartesian like there's no way you could think that animals are just like these mechanisms and you can do whatever you want to them because they're not conscious like that would be pretty hard to defend on like yeah. any panpsychist view. So it's like, <clears throat> I think that um, 
that is something that is still kind of alive and well in some form, even though people might not directly cop to it. Like, they really, really, really undervalue the experiences of, of non-human animals. And it's like, it seems to me that panpsychism, like, you know, it has a direct implication there. Like, it, it means that, in fact, one time I was explaining panpsychism back when I was first learning about it to someone who is religious. And mm -hmm. she said that it's, it's actually, it's a reaction I've never had before. So I don't know how representative this is, but she was like, yeah, I really like that. And it makes a lot of sense to me, but um, it is in conflict with my religious views because I think that oh. animals are not really morally significant. And if you're right, then clearly it's wrong to kill animals. Like she just took it as like, well, clearly if you're right, it, it's really wrong to be killing and eating animals. But according to my like religious views, it's not wrong to do that. So she was kind of like, it was just a weird reaction because she immediately was into panpsychism, but it was like, well, I can't buy into it though, because it would really destroy neo-Cartesianism, which is not the word she used, but um, you know, it, it, it just seems like that's a clear moral advantage of panpsychism is like, there's no way that you can, you know, so evolution already kind of drew this continuity between human beings and the rest of the natural world. And it seems like panpsychism is a step in that exact same direction where it's like furthering the continuity of human beings with the rest of the biological world and obviously the rest of the physical world. But I think it's just another step where it breaks down the barriers between like human and non-human animals. And there's just no way to, to be like some kind of neo-Cartesian and a panpsychist. Yeah, I think what you, you found is very, is very interesting. Uh, one thing to say is that David Clough over at the University of Chester has this view that all Christians should be vegans. And he thinks that, yes, we, and he doesn't hold a, a panpsychist view. He thinks that we can ground our fair treatment of non-human animals in, in scripture. He thinks we can ground it in the in more cr Christian philosophy more generally. So you don't even have to be a panpsychist to think that non-human animals are or ethical subjects but maybe it gives you an extra reason to yeah uh, but yeah i just uh i don't i don't see what the problem is I, I suppose if you it depends on your reading of scripture right i assume this friend is grounds a lot of their beliefs in scripture and if their reading isn't one which includes non-human animals and then someone comes along and says you really should include non-human animals because panpsychism is true and they can experience suffering in, in this way then that might cause them a problem, but I don't see how that is a any different to a problem than the physicalists will will bring to them. Like the, yes, the Cartesian mm -hmm. splits it between the non-human animals and, and the humans, but you know, no other views do, do they? Like we all they they can't. I, I imagine that your your friend thinks that non-human animals can act, can feel pain. Yeah, I mean you would hope so but they, they <laughs> don't i know they don't, they don't have pets if they do <laughs> i i know they don't think yeah. fish can feel pain um you know and like that's part of the advantage of panpsychism over physicalism where at least in this mm. like very narrow respect is like if you look at like the phil paper survey the you know do you think that dogs are conscious do you think cats are conscious do you think that fish are conscious do you think and like you know it just starts dropping off once you get down to like fish and bugs and stuff but like if you're a panpsychist, it seems like you should just infer that, like, yeah, of course, they they're products they're products of evolution, they're organisms. Okay. Like, why wouldn't they be subjects as well? Um, yeah. So, physicalists tend to reject, or it's a lot more common for physicalists to reject, like, fish consciousness. And you have all these horrible things like fishing and like scaling them alive and stuff. Mm. And then they say, "Oh, the fish can't feel pain, so don't worry about it." Um, mm. So, I can't see how a panpsychist would um, would do that unless they're a like a sadist. <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd just say that even if I was a, a cold-blooded physicalist, I'd still think that my cold-blooded cousins in the in the sea could could experience some kind of pain. Um, I, 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 they're just they're just wrong, I guess. I suppose yeah. the it, the 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 evidence from is, is overwhelming that they that they certainly respond to pain, and although we can't get into their minds and crack it open and see the experiences and experience them firsthand uh, we think mary midgley's why animals matter makes this point really nicely we work on the assumption that they can 
and when we try and control and do things to these non-human animals we we whip the we whip the horse or we you know we shout and, and hit the dog and and we do those things wrongly in perhaps all cases but one because we know that that non-human animal is going to is going to experience them and that's not mm-hmm. we we don't think they're just a, a behaviorist mechanism we when we deal with non-human animals we we assume that they are conscious yeah i mean you definitely don't need panpsychism to be concerned with animal yeah. rights that would be pretty weird but i, I think like you know, just by virtue of putting consciousness and subjective experience, like, you know, throughout the natural world, you definitely open up the door for that. Like, it it makes it a lot harder to say things like fish aren't conscious and and Mm. so on. But, um, you know, and sometimes people will use this point actually as like a reductio of panpsychism, where they're like, well, if panpsychism is true, then like, you know, we can probably infer that like trees are conscious and plants are conscious and like forests maybe are conscious and it's just like um yeah it would be completely crazy to treat those with as if they were intrinsically valuable wouldn't it like it's just that's what's so annoying to me is like sometimes people will put this as like a reductio of panpsychism but it seems like it's an advantage of panpsychism where it's like they're implying like when they say oh trees are conscious rivers are conscious maybe forests are conscious and it's like so you think it's crazy that we should treat those things with respect like that we should treat them as if they're intrinsically valuable and that we shouldn't just do whatever we want to them without any yeah. concern whatsoever. Like um, they're just instrumentally valuable. Like we can just do whatever we want. And like, again, to me, that seems like an advantage of panpsychism. It's like, it will, yeah. Like why is it crazy to, uh, you know, have more respect for trees and forests and, you know, and parts of nature where we don't normally mm think that they're intrinsically valuable um but most like i think most people agree whether they think that consciousness is the only source of intrinsic value they agree that consciousness is of intrinsic value um it's just valuable in and of itself like i i it's not like i've done a survey or anything but it seems like many people would sign on to that and so maybe it's not the only source but it's definitely a source and if consciousness kind of pervades nature then that means that nature is something that's intrinsically valuable and worthy of our respect in a way that it's not if it's just purely mechanistic and only of instrumental value and um that's i guess sort of the biggest area where i think that panpsychism has these practical implications and i think they're good practical implications like they mean that you should treat things like trees and forests with respect yeah. That you shouldn't just do whatever you want to them, you know, and just exploit them and like use them to your ends or like, you know, instrumentally um, without any concern for anything. Um, so I do want to ask what you think about that. But I, I think this is connected to something deeper, um, maybe more like pagan almost. But um, first, I, I just want to give you a chance to say something about that. Yeah, so... Okay, what do I think about that? I I thought I my I had a, a question for you really on that, which perhaps I can I can say what my view on it would be first. So the question of as to whether or not that would actually have these practical benefits. What we're talking about here is if panpsychism is true, then what would the implications be? And so we want a, a we want prescription and description. We want to know how people should ought to act in relation to the natural world now and, and how they would act. So, yeah, I, I don't think there's much to say critical about what you just explained. I don't think there's many critical things to say about what you've just said there in terms of how we ought to act in relation to nature. I, I'm just skeptical about the descriptive claim that people would change their attitude towards the natural world in a way that's um, like morally good. But now, loads, an uh, overwhelming proportion of people certainly let's take the uk for example think that non-human animals can experience pain and suffering and happiness and pleasure the footballer in the uk like kick a cat or something recently and Mm -hmm. people are are absolutely outraged why because they don't think the cat's like a washing machine they think the cat can experience this pain these same people are more than happy to support the the industry that raises like pigs and cows and chickens and in confinement for their entire lives and they experience disease and they can't fulfill their ends and that they're they're 
offspring are, are killed from the moment they're born and, and fed to their their siblings and then they're put in the meat grinder at the end of it for it for an unhappy end like that's way worse than kicking a cat mm -hmm. i'd rather kick a cat than eat a pig right that's that seems they're, they're not on the same scale so right. yeah i mean do i like think that people are suddenly going to stop like using paper and like buying nice furniture for their apartments <clears throat> like no like people aren't going to treat the natural world any differently i'm afraid i think people uh, that those degrees of separation well if people aren't going to treat non-human animals differently now what makes us think they're going to actually descriptively treat the the, the natural world outside of that non-human animals differently yeah it, it is incredibly annoying how like one or two animals are harmed that's animal cruelty and it's like reprehensible but you do the same thing actually much worse things with industrial yeah. efficiency to billions of animals and then it's like that's fine what are you even mad about like stop forcing your views on me like yeah, yeah that, that stuff drives me absolutely insane um but you know i i think that um i don't think factory farming and all that is a fact of life like i think it it didn't really arise with like conscious consent of a lot of people like they kind of found out about it and then it's like well how do we undo this like you know what i mean like i don't think people consciously built this they like i think most people don't like factory farming actually um and i don't think it'll last forever um but yeah no there's clearly an inconsistency there but i don't know i just i'm not so pessimistic about that where i think that um people actually don't care like i think that they do but they like taste pleasure and it's mostly out of sight out of mind like there are a lot of reasons that people are kind of apathetic about mm. animal rights and stuff but um again like there there can still clearly be a hierarchy of like moral salience like it's not like yeah. just because something is sentient that you've like can't touch it or something like you can't do anything like what for, I don't even I don't really think that veganism necessarily follows from panpsychism. Like I think that what does follow is that you're doing something that's extremely morally significant when you kill an animal or eat an animal or whether you chop down a tree. Like they're not all equally significant, but I'm saying that they are significant and like those things yeah. warrant your respect. And clearly factory farming is not respectful <laughs> of like yeah. those those animals. Um so when I think about like, you know, stuff like paganism as like, um, mm. they say things like, oh, there's a spirit of the tree and rivers and forests and stuff like that. And they're worthy of like your respect. And that doesn't mean like, it's not like pagans think you can't chop down trees, but um, it's just that you have a fundamentally different attitude towards these things and it changes your behavior towards them. Mm. It's not that you don't touch them and like, oh, I can't, you know, I'm just going to try to suspend myself in a sensory deprivation tank so i don't walk on the sidewalk and, and harm the <laughs> but it's like no you just um uh it's uh it, it's just a total reorientation from the way that people yeah. feel about the natural world now and I, I mean i don't maybe it's naive but i think it really would um it, it could have a sort of like paganistic it could have a sort of like pagan influence over people because i don't know about you but when people before i heard about panpsychism and learned about it and people would say things like oh yeah there's a spirit of the forest and there's a spirit of the tree like i would just be like yeah blah 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 blah. like that's literally just gibberish that, that, what could that possibly mean and then you know i learned about panpsychism and then like i heard that stuff again a couple years later and i was like you know i think panpsychism could provide like the philosophical underpinnings of something like paganism so that that sort of statement could actually you know mean something and be coherent where you say like oh yeah there's a spirit of the tree and like it's worthy of your respect or something like i cannot imagine a way of making that intelligible without panpsychism providing the kind of like underlying philosophical underpinnings so like i think that you know paganism could have a positive influence over the way we relate to nature and the way we treat mm. the natural world and i think that panpsychism can provide the necessary philosophical underpinnings to make this kind of statements that pagans make you know coherent and intelligible <laughs> to someone yeah. like me who's like what are you talking about like the tree has a spirit or the forest has a spirit but anyway it's i've kind of been thinking about that for the for the past like maybe month or so
Cool. I, well, you've been thinking about it a lot longer than I have, which is for the duration of you asking me that question. <laughs> so I, I don't think I'm the authority to be answering it. But I think it. I think it's really interesting. I think maybe it's not the only one. It's not the only candidate panpsychism for paganism. I think you could obviously accept a, a kind of dualism or a kind of polytheism or something like that. Animism. But I think in yeah, I think in terms of reasonable beliefs about uh, like more I, I guess more more palatable to, to for more people like a panpsychist view might might help you along but again i don't know why a, a river or a forest a forest we've spoken about already maybe they could be subjects of experience but mm -hmm. how can a river be a, a subject of experience I, I don't know but i suppose one way in which i personally find the view to be compelling is if you adopted a kind of pantheism or something along those lines and we know that the, the eastern traditions in particular hinduism hinduism has great respect for for the natural world in, in those senses and 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 jainism as well like you can't you have to wait for the fruit to fall etc you can't be stepping mm. on on plants and obviously that respect that deep respect we we're speaking about a moment ago is there um and because the that maybe it's it's putting it a little bit too poetically to say there's a spirit of the plants uh, but there's certainly um, it's worthy of respect because it does have um, some kind of uh, some kind of consciousness even if that's not akin to non-human animals mm. you you just mentioned pantheism and I, you mentioned earlier that you were open to like alternate conceptions of god um mm. do you want to talk a little more about that i mean what do you mean what do you mean I don't that? know really. I just I'm just becoming increasingly convinced by by anything which which isn't atheism. But again, I I'm not settled on any particular view. I like we had uh, Emily Thomas on the Pan Sidecast talking about May Sinclair's view, and May Sinclair's view was that you can have physical stuff in space, but to have time, you need consciousness. And we think that not just like time is passing now, but time was passing on the other side of the universe a very long time ago like asteroids were flying around and all that jazz and pre-dinosaurs there was there was time and so we need mind everywhere and then she ends up with this panentheistic view which says god is the universe the universe is god plus this little extra bit as well which is not a part of the universe and sam coleman has a similar view doesn't he about personhood he accepts non-conscious qualia which might sound like in like it's internally incoherent but he thinks that because there are unconscious qualia, the whole universe is essentially one big mind. And and that seems like a really interesting and, and perhaps compelling view as well. Um, and again, I'm, I'm becoming, like, I, I like the ontological argument. I'm becoming, uh, <laughs> I like the ontological argument and um, I see it as a good reason for believing in, believing in the uh, in, in more traditional idea of God. I know that's not a very popular thing to say, and I think that yeah. might put people off buying uh, buying my book. So maybe uh, <laughs> may, may, I'll I'll defend such a view perhaps in the next book, which is Philosophers on God. But on a serious note, no, I'm I'm open to all of these various hypotheses, and and I think that philosophy of mind has a big part to play in in terms of philosophy of religion and what exactly an alternative concept of God on the pantheistic view would encompass because the theist or the pantheist typically want to say that god is a person that god has like some kind of mind beyond that it does feel like you're just calling the world god mm -hmm. in my book and that and that's you know call it what you like call it blood or blurled like whatever like fine i'm happy with that but if you want to say the world is a person then I see the difference between atheism and, and pantheism. And I think, as I said, philosophy of mind has a part to play in terms of how that mind works and what that mind's like. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I kind of agree where it's like, if you're not a panpsychist, um, how are you a pantheist? Like, because consciousness does kind of seem like a like an essential property of God. Like, if God is not in any way a mind, like, maybe it's not perfectly analogous to ours, but... If he's not in any way conscious or in any way a mind, then um, why why call him God? Like I, I don't understand. So I, it seems like every pantheist should also be a panpsychist. I don't know if that's actually the case, but it seems like that should be the case. Maybe, yeah.
I did have to bring up just one thing, uh, pan cast related, because um, you had a very funny moment um, on the pan cast during the Simone de Beauvoir episodes that yeah. me and my wife still kind of like, I could bring up and she'd probably still remember it. Um, <laughs> so we were driving, we were like commuting somewhere and we were listening to the Simone de Beauvoir episodes and um, it got to this very like moving part when um, Sartre died and she yeah. was like very, you know, she was devastated by it and, you know, like laid with his dead body, his lifeless body for um, like hours after he died. And you were the one who was describing this and um, you started to get a little choked up and you had the most British possible reaction to feeling emotions. And you were just like, <laughs> you just like shut it down and be like, you were, you know, understandably moved by it. Like I, you know, we were both moved by it. And then you were just like, yep. And that's enough of that. We're going to move on now. <laughs> like, <you're> just, <laughs> just like, all right, uh, that's enough feelings for now. Like it was just, it was we, we found that so many times, like when we did like the death of Socrates and you've got like, we did that. It was big eight part series on the last days of Socrates. And then like at the very end he dies and we, we bring it all down, and slow it down. And we do the characters voices emotionally and stuff. And, and then Socrates dies and then like I swear he's about to die and we've got this running joke that he's like into horses but like a little bit too much and then he's just <laughs> I can't remember what he says like I oh, we just it's just an inappropriate joke right where it's what right where we're insinuating it's super emotional or the flowers frowning on one or the notes from underground we again like the main character dies or something and then it's just like something ridiculous at the end of it uh it's, it's, it's just a really good uh like misdirection like we spend a lot of time with the audiobook ones um with the readings rather the, the philosophy of literature episodes it takes so long to redo the the scripts and write them out and then actually do the readings it takes absolutely forever because we we do want to although it sometimes it might seem a little bit off the cuff we we do spend a while saying no say that again say that again say that again get it right <laughs> And then it spent takes forever to do all the sound effects and stuff and get them to mm. feel even slightly immersive. Um, so yeah, we spend a, we do spend a lot of time in the book. Hopefully, manage to you know, elicit a, a, a few different emotions rather than just <laughs> just humor. Yeah, I, I mean, how long does it take you to um, to make like one episode? Because like every mm. episode is like you know, or most of them are like these series like a series of episodes, but how long does it take you to actually series? produce one of those? Like from, yeah, which, from the start of mind. like, you're just starting, you're all starting to read the material to the point where it's like actually yeah. on the podcast feed. Like how long does that take? It, it really, it really ranges in terms of the, like the length of the episode or the type of episode we're doing. So the, like take the flowers for Algernon one, like you need to, it takes a long time. Ollie prepared, basically all the script for that one and that would have taken him like two or three full days of work to like get the script write it all out get it right insert the jokes and and make it flow and then at the same time me and andy are doing the same thing but we're reading the book we're watching both versions of the film with looking at the television series we're reading the uh the autobiography of of the author and and trying to find absolutely everything we can so it's it's really hard to say. I it used to be all consuming before we mm -hmm. were bi weekly, which we've just went to, because it takes an enormous amount of time, particularly when you ha aren't familiar with the philosopher and when you're producing a series on them. But I suppose the answer is, if you take the Simone de Beauvoir one, like, or take the Nietzsche one, we both we all read three, four, five books each, a handful of papers beforehand so however however long that takes all of the episodes typically are recorded in a day so the guys get the train up to liverpool for example the night before we all stay over we talk about the ideas we record all the next day typically we start about nine and finish about eight in the evening and wow. then editing takes yeah it takes like a it, i used to do all of the editing and so to edit a four-part series it would take a day but then if it's a four part audio book series, like the Flowers Trials on Notes from Underground, it could take three or four days to just do the editing. Cause it's so, yeah, it just, it just takes forever. It's just how long it takes. Mm -hmm. um, so we're doing a few less of the audio ones, even though the, 
the favorites i think for some of our long-term listeners but yeah going to bi-weekly it's literally half the workload and it's made it affordable in terms of what we receive through through grants and through the support of our patrons as well and it also means we can you know work on you know, this 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 was produced at the same time as when we were doing weekly episodes which was a killer and i think if i did that again then i'd need to retire in the next few months so <laughs> hopefully it means i can i can do more things like this i haven't i've always wanted to do like a circuit around some of the the philosophy podcasts and and see how people are, are doing things and get to know the community a little bit better and and that's that's something i've been able to do which i, I hadn't been before so hopefully it gives us more avenues to to reach out and, and more platforms we can venture venture into yeah i mean well all that work i mean it's um it's definitely appreciated and i like like i really enjoy the show i've recommended it to tons and tons of people um yeah so i mean if people don't know the pan psychast they should definitely definitely check it out it, it's Makes by the way sense. um it's not just about philosophy of mind it's just a pun so calm down to all the anti-panpsychists in there. <laughs> we get that a lot. So this isn't a podcast about panpsychists. It's like, no, no. Just uh, <laughs> casting thought everywhere. But one exciting thing we we are uh, doing on the 20th of May is here at the University of Liverpool, the Yoko Ono Lennon Centre. Tongue Auditorium has just opened. And we're having Philip Goff. Um, we're having Susan Blackmore, Anil Seth, Laura Gow and the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, on a Philosophy of Mind panel. And so that's going to be open to the public, and it's going to be our first large-scale event. We've done a few small ones, but this is going to be the uh, the big one. It's all going to be Philosophy of Mind. So that's, cool. uh, that's, that's one to look out for. Wow. No, that's awesome. When is that again? 20th of May, which is a Friday evening, uh, and doors close at 7 p.m. We're going to... We're at the moment in talks with a couple of... Uh, organizations to see about getting it live streamed as in the video but if we can't come to some arrangement in terms of uh, videoing it and and publishing the footage even afterwards then a hundred percent certainly we're going to be recording the audio and releasing it on the on our main feed anyway is there anything else that you wanted to cover before we uh, sign off i want uh what do i want to cover I I, there's nothing i want to cover in addition to what we've spoken about I suppose it's been really interesting to hear your views on illusionism and and what you think the moral implications of panpsychism are, etc. Uh, and I'm going to go away and think about this paganism point as to whether panpsychism is the best thing for a for a pagan to to embrace. I think that's a really interesting thought, one which I haven't um, heard or or thought about myself before. So yeah, I've really enjoyed being on the actual show and finally getting to speak to you. But I've seen the daily panpsychism twitter account mm -hmm. which you run which for a while i don't think you had yourself listed in the bio and for a long time i think three on three separate occasions people have said to me do you think that's galen strawson on twitter <laughs> so your views are so closely aligned with galen's and the stuff you share that for a while people actually thought it was it was strawson but it's uh it happens to be his his uh one of his most loyal followers <laughs> ever since green and the final thing to say is i'm glad you enjoyed the book i loved you it enjoyed speaking listen to me and emerson speaking about it dear dear listener or viewer then i'm sure there's a link somewhere emerson mm -hmm. oh yeah it'll all be in the uh, it'll all be in the description but um now i also have a picture of young strawson as the profile picture for that daily pensike is oh okay there you go that's i think that doesn't help i think that's why some people thought i mean i thought i should just pick a panpsychist and he seemed like the, the best choice um you know kind of one of the og like defenders who's you know like going out of his way to defend it when like no one was and like really going against the grain like even mm. thomas nagel who you know um he just never really like embraced it the same way that Strawson did. Like Thomas Nagel always talks about it. Like, you know, maybe this follows from some of the things I'm saying, but he just never really endorses it like the way that yeah. Strawson does. So I thought that he was the appropriate figure to have there. But um, yeah, I, Galen Strawson, I love him. He does not know how to use Twitter. So there's <laughs> zero chance that he was behind that <laughs> Twitter account. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I, I'm sure he could. I think he signed up to support. No, he did sign up to support the Pan Psychast on Patreon once. Well, we didn't know that 
I thought for a second, oh, it's just someone taking the mic. And he's like, mm-hmm. Gaines Strawson's become a patron. I'm sure you won't mind me saying this. And then we went around his, his house a second time to interview his wife, Michelle Montague, on, on phenomenology. He said, Hey, didn't you uh didn't you support some patron? And wasn't your um why aren't you still doing it? It's like my credit card got declined. I just couldn't figure out how to do the stuff. I was like, that's fair enough. But he did buy us around at, at the pub. So I think it was a genuine uh, technological barrier rather than a, him being overly parsimonious. <laughs> he's, he's absolutely lovely. He's one of the loveliest people which have had the um, the honor, really, of, of meeting on, on the show. He sends us all pictures and stuff from being in America and uh, he sends us like little clips and bits of his papers and yeah, he's just uh, he's just a really extremely lovely person the same for, for michelle as well um they're both really really nice and yeah can, can't speak more highly of them well I'm, i'll have to get him on sometime it seems like he doesn't do enough interviews um maybe i'll have to reach out to him but like his the interview that you guys did with him i thought is like one of the best interviews that's ever been done with him like there, there aren't yeah. many so you're gonna say one of the best interviews that have been done full stop <laughs> i was like well, I mean, like, there's. You, you I, did say at the start there, he doesn't do many interviews, but the one <laughs> we did with you is probably the best. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, not a not enough competition. Um, yeah. But I I thought that your interview and the interview that he did with Robert Wright, like, I thought those two were like yeah. exceptional. Um, and he was, I think he was even sick for the Robert Wright one. But yeah, I loved the interview that you guys did with Strawson. Um, I thought that was wonderful. I recommend that one a lot to people as well. Um, and yeah, they should definitely buy the book um, if they if they want to uh, read more about it. But, um, you know, sometimes I'll uh, complain that there aren't really public philosophy communicators in the same way that there are like science communicators. Yeah. Um, but I think that you're a wonderful exception to that rule. And so is the book, which everyone should buy right now. Um, it's the title of this video, so you can just search that. But um, yeah, and also check out the Pan uh, which, as we said, is not just about philosophy of mind, but philosophy generally. And um, unlike my podcast, it has the virtue of being comprehensible to normal people who haven't already given themselves irreparable brain damage from doing analytic philosophy. So definitely check it out. Um, but yeah, I mean, if that's all, then I guess we can leave it there. So Jack Symes, thank you for coming on. Thank you, Emerson. It's been a, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.